You keep pressing in until his presence rests upon your frame so that no matter what you speak on, God validates it because you're his friend. He comes. Immediately he manifests his presence. The atmosphere shifts. The first note you strum, not because you're some great songwriter, because you chose him above all things. And I tell you, we have a young group of worship leaders and preachers in this house that are doing that, precisely choosing this way. And I tell you what, I cannot wait to see them in five years. They will be berated by every assault of the enemy between now and that five or ten year mark. I guarantee you need to pray for Tommy and Lindsay. Tommy will be berated by every attempt of the enemy to draw him out of this prayer wood prayer room to tell him his life's in vain it's not amounting to anything to put financial crisis on him so he can't do it anymore the enemy will come after him with every way and i just want to encourage you as as he's saying up here my heart was just moved pray for him pray for others in the house like this if god would put on your heart support them help them they are giving themselves to a noble cause that is so rarely pursued right now in the body of christ they actually just want him they're not in it for themselves. I watch them back there. They're not getting anything. They're living on next to nothing, contending to go deep in the word of God and to serve the body of Christ worldwide. And so um, I just want to pray for them right now before I even start tonight's message. God, I just thank you for the Tommies. Lord, I, I just thank you for them. Lord, I ask you to increase them all over the earth. Lord, I ask you to raise up an army of worship leaders and singers and musicians and preachers, Lord God, who love you above all things, who are set apart for you and you alone, who look for the reward of your spirit, oil on their inner man, fire in their bones. Lord, I ask you, multiply them, raise them up, provide for them, protect them, hem them in, God. Let them dwell in your house where your glory is. Lord, I ask you, keep them in this place long enough for the residue to be absorbed, to be maintained, to be carried on them. Lord, I ask you, keep them 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Soak them in your presence. Pour them out among the poor and keep them in the place of worship. All for your name's sake, God. So, Lord, I ask you, do this for your good pleasure. Do this. Do this, O oh God. For Tommy and the hundreds and thousands more, just like them. In Jesus' name, amen. Can't help it as the associate director of the House of Prayer, my heart just gets moved over these worship leaders. I so love them. I see them up here paying the price. I can't help it. Okay, turn with me to Isaiah 64. I feel like the Lord's given me a word tonight on our five-year anniversary. I feel like he's dropped this in my spirit today, and I want to bring it forth as a great privilege, as a great delight to actually get to think that men and women get to speak the word of God. One word of God is more weighty and powerful and valuable than all the wealth of all the world combined together. Just one word of God. Just one word. Everything else perishes, Isaiah 40 says. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Has more value. Just one word in the thing. That men and women get to lift up weak words and God matches it with his presence and says, this is the very oracles of God according to 1 Peter 4. The very oracles of God, the very word of God. It's my privilege tonight that God would release his word. And Father, I pray that you would match my weak words with your authority. I pray that you would match my weak, frail, lacking words with power from on high. Lord, I ask that like an arrow shot to the heart, that you would send forth your word and that you would glorify it. That you would make it known in us and through us and among us. Oh God, confirm yourself. Confirm your word. Make it known. Release a testimony, an oracle. 
in Jesus' name. All for love. Isaiah 64. This is one of the greatest prayers in all the Bible. The prophet Isaiah begins to intercede. In fact, he's been in the midst of intercession, but in Isaiah 64, verse 1, it reaches its crescendo. There's a height of intercession. You know, there's a place that you begin to pray, and all of a sudden the wind comes, and you find yourself at a climax. And it begins with the oh. It's the oh. It's the oh. It's the groan. When the Spirit takes up resident in you and prays through you, it's the oh. It's the words. Cannot even express the the depth of the burden. It's the intercessory burden. If you pray long enough, you'll get in that place where the burden overtakes language. And you have no more language. All you know is you started in language. You even got good language. It's flowing. It's fluent. It makes sense. It's orderly. It's impacting. And then all of a sudden you transcend language. And all that's left is, oh, oh God. Have you ever found yourself doing that? Oh, God, that's all you can say. The Spirit is groaning through you. Oh, God. I mean, everything at the end of the day translates, Oh, God, we love you. Oh, God, help us. That's prayer at the end of the day. Oh, God, we love you. Oh, God, help us, no matter what verse you're praying. It's all the same. It's a reaching up, and it's a calling Him to come down. And in this portion... Isaiah has done the reaching up, and now the burden, the intercessory groan, and he cries out, Oh, that you would rend the heavens! Exclamation point. That you would come down! Exclamation point. That the mountains might shake at your presence. As fire burns brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries. That the nations may tremble at your presence! Exclamation point. When you did awesome things for which we did not look, you came down. The mountains shook at your presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen any God besides you who acts for the one who waits for him. Isaiah is appealing to the God, the only God, the one true God, who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. The groan of intercessions crying out. But I tell you, this prayer, you can only truly understand it when you understand the backdrop. This is a prayer that is pertinent for us in this hour. This is a prayer that's birthed as Isaiah was witnessing a prophetic vision unlike any vision he had ever seen. This was the pinnacle of Isaiah's vision. This was the height. He had seen the Messiah from starting at Isaiah 6, the king, high and lifted up, and the train of his robes filled the temple. He had seen the servant. In fact, he had seen the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, but he had never seen this portrait before of Jesus. And in Isaiah 63, 1, he's about to see Jesus in a way he's never seen him. This is more than poetic language. Isaiah, in the prophetic office, he's literally seen something. He's watching something, much like John the Beloved in the book of Revelation is watching. Much like Daniel in Daniel 7, he's watching the unfolding of the end of the age scenario. When the Son of Man will come and judge the nations of the earth. Isaiah has never seen anything like this before. We must understand Isaiah 63, 1 through 6, or we won't get the potency of this prayer and we won't understand its historic significance in our generation. This is a powerful prayer for our generation. This prayer is one of the highest prayers in the Bible. And it's so pertinent for us right now where we are. Let's look at Isaiah 63. I just want to paint the backdrop and then I want to go into the prayer just a little bit. Oh, on our anniversary day, approaching five years, this is the heart cry of this house. Oh, that you would rend the heavens in light 
of what we know is coming in Isaiah 63, of what's been prophesied. In Isaiah 63, verse 1, is the, the glimpse of what Jesus says in Isaiah 61. You know, he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prisons to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the vengeance of our God. You see, Jesus in Luke 4, he stops with the acceptable year of the Lord. But there's a day called the vengeance of our God. And in Isaiah 63, Isaiah is getting a prophetic glimpse of, of the day of the vengeance of our God. You see, he's getting a glimpse of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And in that, he's never seen the Messiah like this. In fact, as he's watching it before him, he says, who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. He asks the question, he witnesses a majestic and terrifying vision of the second coming of Christ. He's coming from Eden with dyed garments and is glorious in his apparel. He's not coming like a lamb to be slain in Isaiah 53. He's seen the suffering servant. He says, I'm seeing him this time and he's different. His robes are dyed. His apparel's majestic and glorious. He's robed as a king. He's not coming as a lamb to be slaughtered. The slain lamb is coming to deliver the earth as a king. He's never seen him like this before. He's stunned. And look at the descriptions. He says, this one who is glorious in his apparel. He's robed now in kingly garments. He's robed not in the humble servant garments of linen that was stripped off him when he hung on the cross. Now, no longer to be mocked by Herod when he was taken to his temple in the trial and Herod placed one of his robes upon him to mock him. This time, he has a kingly garment and the kingly garment was sewn, it was made in heaven. Given to him by the Father. He's wearing the kingly garments. Glorious. The one who is glorious. He's magnificent. His apparel is stunning. Isaiah is glimpsing him. And not only is his apparel stunning, it's his stride that grips him. He's striding. Look, the, it says traveling in the greatness of his strength. But the imagery here is of a lion striding as he goes after his prey. The imagery here is of a king, of a lion who's striding in the greatness of his strength. Have you ever seen a lion run? That's what imagery it is. He's seen the Messiah. He goes, I've never seen him like this in his zeal before. Said, I've seen him in Isaiah 53 in his zeal. Willing to lay down his life for love. But I've never seen him exerting his strength in its fullness like a king. He's traveling in the greatness of his strength. Isaiah is undone. He says, who is this? The suffering servant is now the majestic king striding in the greatness of his strength. He says, I've never seen him like this before. Who is this? Is the question. Who is this? And Jesus answers him, the one striding in his strength. Oh, beloved, have you, I give this imagery. Have you ever been near a lion? Have you ever been near a creature that has such tremendous strength and to watch him stride? Have you ever seen a lion lock in on its prey? The Bible says, once a lion pounces from his den and grabs his prey, who can deliver him? He says, though ten men gather around him with spears, he will not relent, nor will he back down. The imagery here is of a lion, a young male lion that is pouncing on his prey with the greatness of his strength. 
Isaiah is overwhelmed by the force and says, Who is this, Yahweh? Who is this great king? I've never seen a king like this before. Isaiah's seen some great kings in his day. He's seen Sennacherib. He's seen Hezekiah. But he's seen someone, a king, unlike anything he's ever known. Oh, I tell you, when I get near a lion like this, if you've ever grown up near a zoo, it makes you tremble just a little bit, doesn't it? Just makes you tremble. You go, oh, I, are those bars locked? Because if he got out, I don't think there's a tree tall enough or I don't think there's a pair of legs fast enough to get away from his grip. It's overwhelming. That's the imagery here. And Isaiah goes, Yahweh, please tell me. Who is this? And Jesus answers. He said, I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. He says, number one, he said, Isaiah, I'm the one who's mighty to save. I'm the one, the same one from Isaiah 53, the same loving God, the same righteous God. It's me. The suffering servant is also a king this time, not For salvation from sin, this time for deliverance of the earth from sin. Complete removal of iniquity from the planet that he is destined to rule over. He said, it's me, righteous, mighty to save. He says, I want to declare to you right off the bat, before you misjudge me and accuse my heart, He says, you see, Isaiah, in your own hearts a propensity to resist my revelation as a judge. In your own heart, when you see what I'm about to execute on the earth, something in you will rise up and say, aren't you being harsh? Aren't you being strict? Aren't you dealing with the nations in a hostile way? Aren't you doing something against your loving nature? Jesus says, no. Me as a judge is consistent with me as the Savior. He said, I who speak in righteousness, I'm never too harsh. I never overstep the bounds of righteousness. It's me. What you're about to see me do, Isaiah, is righteous. It is good. It is the most loving thing that can be done. I am saving the earth from iniquity forever. And it is a righteous deed that I'm executing. Something in us, Psalm 2 says, that when God, in the hour that he reveals himself as a judge of the earth, something in us rises up in offense and rages against God. Why do the nations rage? Why do they plot a vain thing? Jesus says, I know what's in the heart of men and women on the earth. When I move in my leadership to remove sin, I know within the heart of humanity, when I begin to execute my judgments, there's something that begins to accuse me. But he says, I tell you, the same picture you saw of me in Isaiah 53, of the crucified lamb, is the judge. You see, the cross is as much a statement of God against sin as it is a statement of God for his loving kindness to save sinners. Let me say that again. The cross is as much God's opposition to sin as it is God's mercy to sinners who repent. Hear me. God so hates sin that he's willing to kill his own son over it. You must get the message of the cross clear. The message of the cross is not God slayed his son so that everybody for all time gets off and does not have to deal with sin in a righteous way. The statement of the cross is this. God will judge sin, and he will either judge it in his son as an atoning sacrifice, a substitution, a vicarious atonement, or you will bear it yourself. It is much a statement about God's judgment against sin as it is his mercy to acquit sinners who come in repentance unto him. You must understand that, or you will always see Jesus, the Savior, 
as different from Jesus the judge. No, you must understand. Jesus, in his jealousy, he took sin upon himself out of love. But I tell you, if he does not bear it for you, he will dispense it upon you. Hear me. If Jesus does not bear iniquity for you, he will dispense it upon you. For God has appointed one man as judge at the end of the age. His name is Jesus. He will decide the eternal fate of every man and every woman. And if he does not bear it for you, he will dispense it upon you. We must be clear. Or else if you don't understand the cross in a right way, you will then rise up in your heart and accuse the revelation in the word of God about God as a judge. You must understand that. God in his mercy has poured himself out. He so loves the earth. But I tell you what, God will not let sin remain in his economy. Hear me. Can you imagine if God allowed sin forever to remain in the universe? If he did not judge it once and for all, if he did not have an appointed day that sin would end, he says, I will not strive with flesh forever. I will not contend with men and women forever. I will bring an appointed day to rid the world of sin. And hear, hear me now. We must rejoice in it. Because can you imagine living this way forever? Can you imagine God not in his kind leadership bringing to earth to its right conclusion and ridding his economy of sin so that love would blossom unopposed? So that true communion could take place forever. Beloved, if you, wouldn't, if you couldn't live in this city without a judge... How much more does the world need God to come as a judge? Hear me. If there was not a judge, a judicial system in this city, it would be anarchy and our lives would be miserable right now. Ask any, ask any country that's lived through a dictatorship and watched it fall and anarchy come about. Ask them. You are grateful for the judges in your land right now. You need to pray for them. And I tell you this, we need to be grateful that God is a judge. If he did not execute his leadership in the affairs of humanity, we would be in serious trouble if he did not check sin. And I tell you this, if he did not check it ultimately, we would ultimately be in misery and torment, and this life would be hell forever. We must understand that the one who comes to judge is also the one who's mighty to save. He's righteous in his decisions. He says, I'm the one who speaks in righteousness. I'm mighty to save. He said it's consistent with the nature of righteousness and redemption. It's the last great act of redemption in this age for God to remove sin from the earth. He comes as a judge of all the nations to trample all resistance to love. He will not contend with the flesh of humanity forever. There is a pointed day when love will triumph over evil. He says, it is I, Jesus, the same one who bore the wrath of God on the cross out of love for weak humanity. But I tell you, if you scorn that love there, if you scorn it, if you resist it, if you despise it, the wrath in which I bore, I will then dispense upon you. You must hear that tonight. You must tremble at it. You must tremble at that. Because the judge has been appointed by God to bring human history to a climax, to an end, and has been appointed by God to, to, to appoint the destiny, the eternal destiny of every man and woman. So we must take the cross more serious. It's a once and for all time event where Jesus paid a price you could not pay. Out of love. Out of a demonstration of his jealous heart. Then Isaiah asked another question. 
He says, I see you. I recognize that you're the one who's righteous, the one mighty to save. Your, your nature is consistent. Oh, I tell you, let me just say it this way. We have spent too much time apologizing for God as a judge to secular humanistic society. We spent too much time hiding our people from the revelation of God as a judge. The ones who go through the most trauma, it's like we protect them from God as a judge. Did you know it's the revelation of God as a judge that will set you free from your trauma? Two reasons. Because he will hold those to account who did that to you. Number one. There will be justice. That is healing to the human heart. There is healing to know that there is a Father in heaven who takes account and will hold to account those who bring forth iniquity and injustice upon others. It is a great healing revelation. Not only that, once you get that revelation and you see the fierceness of his wrath against that iniquity caused you, it turns your heart to cry out for mercy for, your vic for the one who victimized you. We can't forgive because we don't realize the seriousness at which they're at odds against God in which he's going to judge them. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. It's real. And we don't get free from abuse in other areas because we don't see God as a judge. We see him as kind of a pacifying agent who would just kind of tenderly, tenderly be there. He's not real powerful to do anything about it. He let it happen, number one. And then number two, he's just kind of there to coach us through it. Wrong! He is coming to judge the earth. He will hold men and women accountable for those sins. If they do not receive his mercy and kindness, they will bear the punishment of those sins. And when you get that revelation, it frees you up that God will vindicate. It heals your heart that he's not distant and removed. And it also makes you recognize, oh my goodness, the fierceness of his wrath in eternal damnation. Oh, I must pray for their forgiveness. I must pray for, them, for God to have mercy upon them. Because whatever trauma they did to me, it can't be worth eternal damnation forever. Separated from God in torment where the worm never dies. Where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It can't be worth that. Oh God have mercy on them. Whatever they did to me. You work it out. But I pray God have mercy on them. The judge heals us. It is I who in righteousness am mighty to save. We must see the judge this way. Isaiah asked a question then. He says why is your apparel red? And your garments like one who treads in the winepress. He says, why, why are your kingly garments all stained? They're red. Why are they splotted? He asked that. If you're here to save and you're speaking in righteousness, why are your garments all filled with blood? Jesus answers in verse 3. He said, I had trodden the winepress alone. And from the peoples, no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Oh, the language. Isaiah has never seen God like this. He's prophesied about it, but now he's getting a picture of Jesus manifesting it. He says, I've trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. This is not a picture of the cross. This is a picture of the second coming. This is a picture of Jesus' judgments on the opposition, on the rebellious nations. This is not a symbolic reference to the cross. It has nothing to do with the cross. Look at the context. Look at it. It has nothing to do with it. His blood, his garments were not stained by the blood of the nations on the cross. They were stained by his own blood. And either we will receive the staining upon his garments by his blood, or he will stain his own garments with the blood of the nations. It's the only two options. Either he bears the wrath or he dispenses it. He said, 
Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments. And I have stained all my robes, for the day of vengeance is in my heart. And the year of the redeemed has come. I looked, but there was no one to help, and I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me, and my own fury, it sustained me. Hear the language, the fury. Can you picture Jesus furious? Can you picture the day that vengeance is in his heart? For I've trodden down the peoples in my anger. I've made them drunk in my fury. I've brought down their strength to the earth. Isaiah has never seen Jesus like this. Isaiah has seen the dashing of the nations that David warns the rulers about in Psalm 2. He says, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessels. Now therefore be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. It's what Psalm 110, 5 and 6 prophesy concerning. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. Jesus answers that it is blood that stains his garments. It's the blood of the rebellious nations who gathered against the Lord and against his anointed one. The nations that resisted the rule of God have become the focus of the most terrifying force in heaven and earth. You must picture what Isaiah is seeing. The most terrifying force in the face of the earth or heaven is the fury of the wrath of the Almighty meted out in His Son Jesus, walked out in the Messiah. It's the most powerful, terrifying force. Psalm 110, he'll execute kings. He'll fill the places with dead bodies. He says, I will come in vengeance. He calls it the day of the vengeance that's in his heart. Now, you must hear me on this. Jesus has a day of vengeance in his heart. He really does. It's the day when iniquity will finally be removed from the human experience. Did you know Psalm 45, the great wedding psalm, says this? That he hates wickedness and loves righteousness. Therefore God has anointed him with the oil of joy above all his brothers. Above all his companions. You know what gives joy? A day of joy in Jesus' heart is the day he removes iniquity from the human experience forever. Can you imagine what the God man has to listen to on a daily basis in the cries and the groans of the oppressed on the earth? Take the worst case scenario you read about in the paper and times it by a hundred million on a daily basis. And can you imagine what the judge who is the most tender hearted out of anyone in all the universe, the most tender hearted, compassionate one is God. And he has to witness it on a daily basis. Can you imagine in Genesis 6 when he said, the whole earth is filled with corruption. Men and women could live a thousand years refining their expertise in wickedness and iniquity. The gift of God was to make the lifespan of man and a woman 120 years at the most. Can you imagine you get the age of 19, you're filled with corruption and violence and murder and injustice, and you have another 900 years to perfect it. Beloved, when God wiped out the earth with the flood, it was for good reason. You don't know the depths of his mercy that day. The Lord found grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That day, the earth was filled with violence, it says. And at the end of the age, iniquity. It says in Matthew 13, the tares and the wheat will grow up together. Iniquity will reach its fullest point, And the rage of Satan will reach its fullest point. And God, in Christ Jesus, has a day of vengeance when he will shut Satan and his cohorts up into the abyss. And he will remove sin forever. It's the day of vengeance in his heart. It's his wedding day. He's jealous for it. And let me tell you, he's as jealous for that day as he was for the day he hung on that cross out of love for you. Hear me. He is as jealous for that day 
the day of the vengeance in his heart as he was for the day he hung on the cross for you. It's the same God with the same nature. Deuteronomy 28, 63 says this. He goes through the blessings and says, Oh, how greatly I delight to bless you. Then he goes through the curses and he names a lot of them because in his kindness he gives a lot of curses so at some point in the curse they'll wake up before it's too late. You first read it and you just read about four verses of his blessings and then another 50 some of his curses and you go, what kind of God is that? Well, it's a kind God who doesn't just destroy you because you did one offense. He, you stumble, he releases a curse in order to discipline you that you'll wake up. Oh, there's no rain. Oh, God must not be here. Oh, forgive us. Oh, the, the locusts are coming. Oh, there's, there's an invading army. He does it as a process in his kindness because his, his long-suffering heart. He's the most compassionate. He has to bear these things. But I tell you, it says in Deuteronomy 28, 63, and it shall be that just as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to nothing. Do you hear that? There is the same jealousy to destroy stubborn rebellion and contentious iniquity that refuses to repent as there is to forgive the weakest of the weak of the weak in the depths of his heart of compassion. It's not either or in the heart of God. It's the same manifestation of righteousness. That the weak who cannot make it themselves would find favor and find grace to go the full distance. And the rebellious and the stubborn who refuse to repent to God would utterly be removed and judged and, and appointed a day of reckoning. It's the same jealousy. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 10 says, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe. Paul says there's a single day coming. It's the great and terrible day of the Lord. It's the great day of his wedding where the saints will be delivered from oppression and will be brought into final consummation with their maker and their king. And it's a day of terrifying power when God will remove iniquity with the same amount of zeal that he saved you in your weakness. It's the great and terrible day. That's why in verse 4 of Isaiah 63 it says, For the day of vengeance is in, his, is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. How can you put those in the same sentence? It's the same reality. The judge is the Savior. Depending on where you're at and how you've received his love is what happens on that day. It's the day of vengeance in his heart, or it's the day of the redeemed. There's no difference. It's I who speak in righteousness. I'm mighty to say. Are you tracking with me? It's the day. And can you imagine? And I want to emphasize this again. God is the most tender hearted. He never shuts off his heart from filling the oppression of the oppressed on the earth. You and I can shut it off. We can put the newspaper down. We can pull away to our suburban home. But God never lets up from filling and sympathizing with all the traumatized and oppressed and victims of the whole world all at once, every day, all day. He does have a day of vengeance in his heart. The tender-hearted Jesus will bring forth a day of reckoning. He's appointed it. It's appointed unto man to die once and give account to God. But there's, a, there's more than that. There's, there's coming a day when we, when a generation won't die, Jesus will come back and institute the great day of the Lord. That's what Revelation 19 describes. It says, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. Wait a minute, Alan. In, in the first part of the chapter, it was the wedding supper. 
It was hallelujah for the wedding of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. Why did you have to wreck it with verse 11? We so like the wedding supper. We had no idea there's another feast coming. It's called the feast of the birds. There's two feasts on the great day of the Lord. The wedding supper of the Lamb and the feast of the birds. It's both the same God with the same consistent nature who in righteousness is mighty to save. It says, He who sat on him was faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The buck stops here. The executive decision will be made that sin will be removed and love will triumph. Isaiah goes on to say, I looked, Jesus goes on to say in Isaiah, I looked, but there was no one to help me in verse 5, and I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me, and my own fury, it sustained me. He said, I have enough zeal in my heart that even though all the leaders of all the nations resist my loving kindness, I have enough zeal to carry through with the Father's plan to rid the earth of iniquity and Satan and his demons. I have enough zeal to pull it off on my own, even if all the dignitaries and magistrates of the earth do not enter into this revelation. Like Psalm 2, it's come true. All the nations have raged against his rulership under the auspices of a demonized king so-called the son of perdition, the Antichrist. The nations have been deceived. But Jesus, in his zeal, he refuses he refuses for iniquity to persist, and he is zealous for love to win. Do you hear me? The judge has one desire, for love to win. Jesus, in his second coming, he delivers his people from the nations who have pressed and killed them. He has two feasts. I've said it, but I want to say it again. There's two feasts on this day that he comes. There's two feasts. The first, it's why Job describes it. Job describes it as the great and terrible day of the Lord. It's great because it's the day when the redeemed get delivered and we get resurrected bodies and we have the wedding supper of the Lamb and we'll never have to strive or war against unrighteousness in our members. There'll be righteousness within, righteousness without. Love will blossom. We will reach heights of intimacy and pleasure untold to the human experience. In fact, he says he has a name you don't even know yet because you need a, you need a resurrected body to experience that depth of pleasure in the Godhead. That's the first feast. But I tell you, there's another feast in Revelation 17 through 18. It's the feast of the birds. This is the terrifying feast of the birds who are invited to feast on the flesh who are slain in the day of the Lord. In the day of the conflict between Jesus and the opposing nations and the armies of the Antichrist. Verse 17 says this. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven. Come and gather together for the supper of the great God. Come and gather together for the supper of the great God. The same great God who they sang hallelujah to is the same great God who's going to put on this feast as well. That you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. This vision terrifies Isaiah. 
Imagine how it leaves the prophet. We've only described it in weak human words from a weak, frail preacher. What if you were seeing it with your eyes? What if you were beholding it within the prophetic vision? What if you were seeing Jesus like this? What would be your response? What would be the response that is appropriate in the hour that this is about to break in on the earth? Beloved, this does not thrill me. It thrills me that love will ultimately win and Jesus the judge will be vindicated in righteousness and in love. But I tell you, it doesn't thrill me that the nations of the earth will be invited, that the birds of the air will be invited to feast on the flesh of the nations of the earth. This is a burden. It grips me. And Isaiah is gripped. The only appropriate response comes forth in verse 7. Isaiah sees what's coming. He sees the state of the nations. And he sees that the people of God are not prepared for that hour. And he has one cry. He lifts up his voice to the loving kindness of God. And he prays. There is only one appropriate response in this hour, beloved. We have many religious things we do, but there's one appropriate response in this hour on the earth. We are in a serious time of human history. Isaiah says in his prayer, he lifts up his voice. He's shaking, he's trembling like Daniel was trembling in Daniel 7. Like Daniel said, his spirit was trembling within him like a sword in a sheath when it rattles. Isaiah is quivering. When Jeremiah saw this, he quivered. He said rottenness entered his bones. When Habakkuk saw this, it said his lips quivered. He was undone. Every prophet who's seen this picture has quivered and trembled and entered into intercession. Isaiah does the same thing. He says, I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord. And the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed upon us. And the great goodness towards the house of Israel. Which he bestowed on them according to his mercies. According to the multitude of his loving kindness. For he said surely they are my people. Children who will not lie. So he became their savior. And in all their affliction he was afflicted. And in... And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and his, his, in his pity, he redeemed them and bore them and carried them all the days of old. He said, God, in the days of the Exodus, it was your loving kindness that heard the groans of the prisoners. And you answered them. They did nothing to deserve it. And they heard, you heard their groans. And you delivered them in your loving kindness and in your goodness over them. You fashioned them as your people. You carried them. You took care of them in your pity. You redeemed them. And then he says in verse 10, but they rebelled against you. He said, this has been the way of the people of God. They're not ready for the ultimate judgment of humanity. Even the people of God have rebelled against you. They have not stayed faithful. So you turned against them. You fought against them. But God, then you always came back with loving kindness and restored them. And he appeals to to God in verses 11 through 14. He says, you were the one that caused your spirit to rest upon them. You're the only way the people of God grow into maturity. You're the only hope. We can't get there by ourselves. And then he cries out in verse 15. He says, look down from heaven. He says, look down. He appeals to the merciful and zealous and compassionate heart of God. He said, see from your habitation, holy and glorious. Where are your zeal and your strength? The yearning of your heart and your mercies toward us. Are they restrained? He said, God, I know you're jealous. Just as much as you're jealous to judge iniquity on the earth, ultimately, you are jealous and you yearn for your people to respond now. You're jealous to bring them into maturity to prepare them for this day. You have long suffering. First Peter says it this way, or Second Peter says it this way. It says that he is not slow in keeping his promises, but he is long suffering, desiring that none should perish, that all would come to repentance. 
The yearning heart of God says there is an ultimate day that I will judge iniquity. But in the meantime, I'm longing for you to draw near. It's an hour of amnesty. It's an hour of mercy. I have much to give you in love if you'll receive it. Isaiah pulls upon that mercy. He pulls upon that yearning. He goes, are they restrained? And look at verse 16 through 19. Now he's about to lay forth. He states in these verses that the people of God are, are unrecognizable today. He said, doubtless you are our father, though Abraham was ignorant of us and Israel does not acknowledge us. In other words, here's what he's saying. Abraham, the people of God that exists today, Abraham doesn't even recognize us. Though we're his offspring, we have nothing in common with the spirit that was upon that man. Israel, the early fathers, they have nothing in common with us. He goes, we're a rebellious house. We've fallen. He said, our fathers don't even recognize us. We've fallen so far. And then he appeals to God. He said, but you're our father. Help us. He says, why have you made us to stray from your ways and harden our heart from your fear? He knows that the fear of the Lord is the only help. He says, return to us. Return to your holy people. We've only possessed the promise, but a little while. Our adversaries have trodden us down. We become like those of old over whom you never ruled. We became like those who you wiped out in Genesis 6. Long before Abraham. Abraham doesn't even recognize us. Beloved, if there's any hour to hear these verses, it is right now. I tell you, this is where we're at today. If the apostles were looking down, they would hardly recognize what exists in the Western world in this hour. What we read about in the book of Acts is so far removed from our daily experiences in the Western world. We right now, according to George Otis Jr. and the Sentinel Group, there are approximately 175 transformed cities on the earth today. That means the gospel has penetrated them and influenced every level of society. Presently, there is not one transformed city that exists in the Western world. Yet we have more Bible schools, more training institutions, more discipleship groups. We have more we have more books and CDs and publications than any nation on the earth. And we don't even have one transformed city. And we think we're leading the charge. I tell you, Paul can't even recognize us. We're so divided and caught up in our little schemas. If someone does something different, well, you're not submitted to a local church pastor. Well, where was your church planted from? Somebody split off somewhere, I guarantee you, in the Western world before something was started. Do we all become Catholic? Something split off somewhere. In other words, it's not about who's under right headship in this hour. It's under the issue of not human headship. Are we under the headship of Jesus? Do, does he really recognize us in this hour? We have more at stake than the Western church, local church paradigm. We have at stake that the saints of old don't hardly even recognize us. Cancer does not leave when we pray for it. Blind eyes do not open. Governors do not take us seriously. I'll never forget it. When one of the, the top senators in our land who sits on the, on the, on the committee of the Near East... And he was calling up the top ten leaders in the Western world, asking them for the word of the Lord. Should we go to war or not? Should we do this or not? He was asking for the prophetic word. He said, I'm so, I'm so downhearted. He said, all ten gave me different answers. It sounded more like opinion than it did that they knew the word of God. He said, either God is really confused or we don't know him like we perceive. That was the most honest answer I've heard in a long time. Isaiah recognized the barrenness of the day. He said, oh God, Abraham doesn't, he's ignorant of us. He doesn't know us. Israel, they don't even acknowledge us. We're so 
far removed from their initial spirit of faith and of holiness and of power. We're so far removed from it where it's almost like we're not even of the same seed. Beloved, we are in that position right now. We, we lack any true power. And instead of in our barrenness, crying out like Isaiah, because a storm is about to hit planet earth, it's called God. The second coming will come. He will not delay. He will come like a storm upon the earth. And the people of God must be prepared so we can look, so we can look nigh for our redemption draws near. So that we're not part of the offended. For Matthew 24 says the love of most will grow cold and they will become offended. We do not want to be part of that company. We want to cry out in our barrenness and intercession. Isaiah says I only have one hope when there's barrenness and it's not religious activity. It's not the pretend the machine's going. Right now. Everyone has apostle and prophet on their name card. And not one of them's in prison in the U.S. I can't believe it. Not one. We don't have one transformed city with all these apostles and prophets. And no one's in prison because they shook the power establishment. Certainly Jeremiah doesn't recognize us. Certainly Elisha does not recognize us. Where are the prophets today, beloved? Name one, when they go to a city, it's absolutely riveted like when Paul and Barnabas went to one. And yet we think the restoration of the fivefold ministry has arrived. Oh, I tell you yet, we have not even begun to see the word of the Lord come forth with power in our day. And God has given a great test. Would we rather have the name on our card or would we rather have authority to move angels and demons when we speak and when we pray? Because I tell you, that kind of authority finds itself in jail at the end of the day. Ask any of the prophets. Ask Paul. Ask Peter. He'll tell you, hanging upside down on a cross. We need God. It's the hour to cry out like Isaiah. We have one hope. And Isaiah prays the solution in Isaiah 64, 1 through 4. I don't say that as if I'm up here haughty going, look at us, how bad we are. I'm part of it. It's me. Paul doesn't recognize me. I'm heartbroken. I tell you, healing's happening in our healing rooms and prophecy. But I tell you, it's not breaking out. Blind eyes aren't opening every day yet. Cancer's not leaving. We just buried one of our terminally ill the other day. It breaks my heart. I can't just do the grind and hold a signs and wonders conference and say, look. Because if you look, they don't even recognize us from heaven. I can't I can't just feed the machine because I'm part of the problem. And Isaiah hits that point. He says, "We have become like those of old over whom you never ruled." He says, "Those who you never called by your name, we were so deceived. We thought we were on target. We thought we had such a fancy ministry." We were so consumed with the unfolding of our callings, we never even realized that your glory had left the temple. Those who were never called by your name, he said, and there's the groan. Do you feel it? Now the groan comes. Oh! Oh! Oh, that you would rend the heavens. Oh, that you would come down. We have only one hope in America, God. That's that you would actually come and help us. Oh, that you would rend the heavens. Oh, that you would.
that you would come down, that the mountains might shake at your presence, that you would baptize us with fire, as fire burns brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, as it burns up the chaff, as it removes the infirmities. Oh God, we need a baptism of fire. Oh, I tell you, the Holy Spirit only come upon, came upon one man as a dove. That's Jesus. He was perfect. But I tell you, for all of us rest, we get fire. He says as fire causes water to boil. To make your name known to your adversaries. He said, oh, the adversaries of God are ruling over the people of God. They've subdued them. Sickness, oppression unrighteousness, iniquity, perversion, immorality, dishonesty, theft, murder. It's all manifesting in the body of Christ, suing one another, taking each other to court, jockeying, ambition, envy, selfishness. He said, oh, that you would remove the mountains, that they would shake that you would break the strongholds, that you would baptize us with fire. If there's ever a day we need Luke 12, 49, where Jesus said, oh, I have a, baptize, I have a baptism to baptize you with, and how I wish it were kindled already. How I wish I would pour out fire upon you now to refine you, purify you, make you white, to empower you. said, oh, come down, God. It's our only hope. I tell you, there's only one hope in America. There's only one hope in the Western world. We'll actually believe that prayer is fruitful, that admitting our barrenness is helpful, and that prayer can shift things to a loving, kind God. And he says, you know why? I'm crying out for the baptism so that your name could be known that the nations may tremble at your presence. Right now, no nations tremble at our presence. No one trembles at us, beloved. No one's trembling. No city governors are really concerned that they're going to be removed from power because God's going to manifest His glory and turn the city upside down and the bars will close and the prostitution rings will be, will be totally removed. No one's concerned. In San Francisco, as they're getting married, no one's trembling. The governor, the mayor, I mean, the mayor's not even trembling. Yeah, we'll hold our conference. We're taking San Francisco. No, you're not. The mayor is, un is unmoved by your prayer at this point. He's not even trembling. Oh, but I tell you, I'm not saying that to... to to put a curse on us, I'm saying this. We must get honest so we can pray like Isaiah. If we don't pray, I don't have any hope. And I mean corporate prayer. I mean a people of God crying out for God to really come. Not having the right key to unlock. Having a move of prayer and a spirit of prayer resting on the people of God. Oh, I tell you, there's coming a last great witness at the end of the age. God will release his voice with power. He will make his name known again. There is coming a witness to the church. There is coming a season of great grace, Isaiah says, when God comes amidst the church and manifests demonstrations of his power and glory to refine, to purify, and to make the nations tremble again. And let me tell you why. He wants to meet an equally yoked bride in the air on that day. And number two, he wants to release in his great mercy strategy the word of the Lord on the earth in power through the church that many multitudes, massive conversions can take place. He would rather them meet him at the cross than in Basra. 
He would rather than meet him at the foot where love had its way for human beings if they choose to say yes. He will do this, Isaiah says, not because we deserve it. We're unrecognizable right now. But in his kindness, if we enter into the place of intercession, he will release a great witness on the earth. It will come to us. Bob Jones' word as I stand here at the five-year mark, his word on March 7th, 1983, he said this to Mike Bickle, young man, this is it. God has called you in this place to spearhead a prayer movement that will go worldwide. He said in the very town, the very place next to the Truman Farms, he said God will raise up a worldwide prayer movement just as Harry S. Truman interceded for the political establishment of Israel. So God will raise up a spiritual intercession, an intercession for, spirit, for Israel to be saved spiritually. It will begin in this city. God will do it here and he will raise it up. He'll do it. He's doing it all over. He's, we're just one of many. But God prophesied from here he will begin it. And five years later I stand here. And I tell you, I'm given to one thing at the five-year mark. It's this. Oh, in light of what's coming, in light of our state of barrenness, I have one place and one place alone. It's on the wall. Oh, Lord, rend the heavens and come down that the mountains might shake at your presence. Would you baptize us with fire as fire causes brushwood to burn and water to boil? So would you make your name known and make the nations tremble? He says in verse 3, when you did awesome things for which we did not look, you came down. He says in Egypt, we had no idea. And you came suddenly out of nowhere. So he says at the end of the age... In the midst of barrenness, God will come again. He will raise up his church. Beloved, I'm in the pain of the not yet, but I want to tell you before I close this message, it will come. I stand here at the five-year mark and I can prophesy with as much and more boldness that he will come to this city. He will answer this prayer that we've been praying for five years. Yea, ever since 1983 for 21 years, but in a focused way for five years, he will come and he will baptize us with fire. I want to read two scriptures and then I'm closing. Turn with me to Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. The parallel passage of that is Luke 24. If you look at Luke 24, I'll just read it real quick. He says, Behold, I send you the promise of, the, of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. But you, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And in Acts 2.17... He says this, and it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servant and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming of the great an awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He says, Peter said something has been inaugurated today at Pentecost. 
But before it's over, he will pour his spirit out one last time upon all flesh as the last great witness to the human race of God's coming, ultimately in a son, to judge the nations and to vanquish evil and to set up a kingdom of love forever. God will release his word. But I tell you now with Isaiah, it will come out of prayer. Tarry in the city. Tarry until you receive power from on high. Peter says, as it was done in this, lo this small location today in Jerusalem, so it will happen in the last day, says God. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and they will all prophesy of a coming day. And everyone who hears the word of the Lord and calls upon his name shall be saved. Let's stand.